Okay, so I'm having said I'll leave it a couple of minutes. I'm guessing actually that everybody is here who is going to be here just now. So maybe we'll kick off and maybe we'll start. Um, so, so welcome everyone today. Uh, I'm hoping you are chemical pathology trainees and you're here to join us to hear about how the college works, how your training will work and, and really as an induction to, to being a trainee. So it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nikki, so I'm a neuropathologist by background and I'm clinical director of training and assessments at the Royal College of Pathologists. And we've got a, a really great program today. Um, we hope you're going to interact. We hope you're going to ask lots of questions in the Q&A function and the team will do the best to answer those as we go along. Um, the session is being recorded and we're going to put it up on the website in about a week or so, um, so that it's there as a resource for people who weren't able to join us today. So I do hope that's okay. It doesn't mean we won't see your faces, but hopefully the, the function will work well. So within the function today, you're going to hear some recorded sessions, I'm afraid, and some that are live, and we'll talk you through um, the, the full process. But there are a couple of people behind the scenes in the training team who aren't speaking today. So it would be really good for me to introduce them. So firstly, there's Jenny. Jenny, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Jenny McGinley. I'm the training manager at the college, and hopefully I'll get to know you as you go through your training. And there's also Sandra, who is 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 Queen of Workplace-Based Assessments and Queen of Portfolio, but not talking about it today. Over to you, Sandra. Hi, everyone. I'm Sandra Dura Crichton. I'm the Assessment Manager at the College, and part of my remit is managing the LEP system, which my colleague Michael will tell you about um, later this morning. So listen, we hope you have a, a really great few years through training. Um, it is a big undertaking uh, selecting a specialty like chemical pathology, but it's a great one and you really have a huge opportunity to make a difference in your professional lives um, as a trainee and in the future. So without further ado, I'll hand over if, over if I can to Professor Mike Osborne, who's president of the college. Hello, my name is Professor Mike Osborne and I'm president of the Royal College of Pathologists. I'd like to welcome you today to this, our new trainee day. Pathology is hugely important. 95% of every single healthcare interaction in the United Kingdom is underpinned by a pathology test, ranging from blood tests, the histology, to the multitude of other tests pathology offers. We are 17 specialties in pathology, and we welcome everybody from everywhere who is part of the pathology family to be represented by the college, and I would welcome you today. Our 17 subspecialties cover a diverse range of interests and areas of healthcare. Some of them are very, very directly patient contact related. So, for example, we have specialties like hematology, microbiology and infection, where people may be involved in face-to-face -face clinics with patients and directly see them on a day-to-day -day patient care basis. Others of our specialties are far less directly patient facing. So for example, some may be very laboratory based with people rarely seeing patients in a face-to-face -face situation. For example, histopathology. However, all our specialties are vital to patient care and all our specialties are patient focused. You could not have healthcare without pathology. So we are a fantastic speciality within medicine as a whole. In addition to a variety of interaction with patients, <clears throat> some of our specialties are very laboratory based. So for example, again, histopathology, some of our clinical chemistry colleagues and so forth. Others are much more based in other environments, be they in the clinic, in the terms of hematology or in other areas, for example, forensic pathology, where people may very, very rarely go into a laboratory. And what this means is that there's a whole range of specialties within pathology and there's something to suit everybody. But again, I must stress all of our specialties are patient focused and play a vital role in patient care. Because of the wide range of specialties we cover, there is something for everyone. And within those, there are a huge range of opportunities within pathology. 
Those opportunities range from healthcare on a patient to patient and case to case basis to other things like research and teaching. For example, research is an area where pathologists are always in demand, whatever specialty of pathology they belong to. Virtually no research can be undertaken without pathology input because it is so key to patient care and to interpreting the data and to interpreting the way that the, the research is designed, structured and run. So pathology is core to this. And what this means is that from a research perspective, if you would like to pursue an academic career, there will be likely opportunities for you. But similarly, if you are working as a pathologist doing diagnostic work, there are a whole range of research opportunities that will be open from a project to project basis for you if research is an area you are interested in. The opportunities are manifold in pathology for research. Similarly in teaching, because pathology underpins all of healthcare, there are opportunities in a wide range of teaching for a wide range of people, from medical undergraduates to medical postgraduates, of all medical specialties, but also allied healthcare professionals as well, be they nurses, mortuary staff, or people more loosely affiliated with healthcare who need to have interactions and teaching. I personally have been involved in teaching the police, the military, and so forth. So there's a whole range of opportunities. And again, if teaching and training are areas of specific interest to you, there are large numbers of opportunities in pathology, whichever specialty you pursue. And the result of this range of specialties and range of opportunities is you can develop a career that really suits you, that really, really allows you to do things that you are interested in and to develop your area of expertise. In addition, because pathology is so wide ranging, there are lots of job opportunities in pathology, job opportunities virtually anywhere within the United Kingdom, or indeed around the world. And this means people can work where it is most convenient for them. In addition, pathology is very, very family friendly. This means that it fits well with your work-life balance and gives opportunities for people to pursue their interests outside of work, leading to a much better life-work balance. Pathology is very flexible, and this is becoming more so as IT and so forth develop, which means people are more able to work from home, are more able to work flexibly, which means, again, work-life balance benefits. In terms of the college, the Royal College of Pathologists was formed 60 years ago and is here to support all our pathology specialties. This means that whatever specialty you are in, there is the college is there to support you, to help you, and to, to lobby for you to have the support and resources you need to be able to provide the healthcare to your patients that you want to, that they deserve. So the college is there for you. Benefits in terms of the trainees include things, for example, like active trainee committee who feed into many of the activities of the college, giving us a trainee perspective, making sure the college never lose sight of the role of trainees and the importance of trainees, the next generation of consultants. We've got a website that offers a whole range of resources specifically for trainees, and we are currently just about to launch the pathology portal, which is a superb online vehicle for learning for trainees and others. In addition to that, we run webinars, teaching sessions, and so forth. So there are a whole range of things that the college offers specifically for training. But beyond that, the college is there to support the profession, particularly in terms of raising the role of the profession nationally and internationally, and ensuring that the profession has the resources it needs to be able to provide the services it needs to its patients particularly around things like workforce and so forth. Pathology is a fantastic career. It offers a whole range of opportunities and there's something for everyone. 
At the Royal College of Pathologists, we welcome everyone who is a pathologist and everyone who works in pathology. We are keen to support anyone who is interested in a job in pathology and our trainees are a valuable resource to us in the college. We will work hard with you and to support you and help you develop a great career in pathology. I would like to welcome you today to the trainee day and I look forward to welcoming you in the future. Welcome to pathology. Great. Okay. Um, my name is Jo Brinko and I'm the Director of Learning at the College. Um, I'm going to give the next talk, which is just to explain a little bit about the role of the College. Um, my job at the College is that I oversee um, the Learning Directorate, which includes um, training, assessment and examinations, as well as the international activity of the College. So I will just uh, quickly share my screen. Excellent. OK, so welcome again, everybody. Um, just to uh, show you a little bit about what the, the college building actually looks like. Um, obviously, we're all meeting virtually today, um, but if you do get the opportunity to come and visit the college, then um, you are very welcome. You can see uh, in this picture here, this is our reception area. And just at the back here, that area there is for uh, members and trainees. So if you do come into London, you are able to come into the college when we're open, which is normal standard office hours, um, Monday to Friday. And you can use that area if you want to come and do some quiet work or uh, perhaps meet with a colleague. Um, so please do make uh, use of that if you're able to. Um, but the purpose of my talk today is really just to give you an idea of um, what the college does, but also to outline what some of the other organisations that are involved in your training do, because it can just sometimes be a little bit tricky to know who does what and who to ask for certain things. But um, the, the message really is, if you're ever unsure, you can always contact the college. And even if we're not able to help you, um, we can normally always direct you to um, the organisation or the person you need to speak to. Um, but the college is a professional membership organisation, um, and we're also a re registered charity. Um, and we are concerned with, as uh, Professor Osborne said, all matters to do with um, the practice of pathology. Um, we have fellows, affiliates, and of course, you as our, our trainees until you uh, become fellows yourself once you pass the college examination. Um, and then just a little bit about um, what we offer you as a college and, and what you, you know what you can get from us particularly during your uh, your training period um so the college has a uh, specialty training committee which is chaired by dr adrian park who you're going to hear from after me um and that committee has representation from all of the training program directors around the uk um and they are responsible for um overseeing all issues to do with training um specifically they also will develop the curricula and the assessments and we've just been through a sort of two to three year period where we've just um, revised our curricula and you're only the second cohort of trainees to, to join that curriculum. Um, we also obviously run the examinations and again you'll hear from Dr Sanjeev Manik who's our clinical director of examinations in a little bit um, just to give you a very broad outline of the examinations at this stage. Um, you'll also be hearing from my colleague Michael who will give you a brief introduction to the LEP system which is the e-portfolio that supports your training and again in tandem with the curriculum um, and assessment development that we've been doing the e-portfolio has also been developed so that it maps exactly to the new curriculum that you will be following. Um, we also provide ARCP guidance but we don't um, organise the ARCPs for you, that's your deanery and I'll come on to that in a little bit. And as Mike has already mentioned, our pathology portal went live on Monday and that is a resource that you will be able to make use of as you progress through your training. And you can come to us, primarily it will be Jenny and her team, but you can come to us for um, advice uh, um, or guidance or if you have any questions about your training, um, the college is here to advise you about that. And when you get to the end, and it might seem a long way away now, but it goes very quickly, um, the college will be able to recommend you for the certificate of completion of training for you to be able to get um, obtain entry to the specialist register. And that's what allows you to be able to apply for a consultant post in the UK. 
as Mike mentioned, we also have a trainee advisory committee, and I think Matthew will be talking to us uh, a little later. Dr. Matthew Clark is the chair of the trainees committee. Um, I and um, the clinical directors and the vice president for learning meet with the trainee advisory committee twice a year, uh, where we tell the trainees about the work that we've been doing and they can share um, their questions with us, any issues. Um, and, and those are really good meetings where we're able to, um, you know, speak freely with each other and, and we find them really helpful. Um, there are obviously your training takes place uh, regionally and as I've said we've got uh, close working relationships with the training program directors and we also meet twice a year with the heads of pathology school as well just really so that we can make sure that we you know everybody is informed and, and knows about everything that's going on in uh, pathology training and also so that any issues can be raised and we can deal with them. Um, and, the, and the college also um, organises some external input into um, primarily the ARCP process by providing an external representative to, to the ARCPs that take place. Um, and just because I do have a, a um, role in, in international, um, one of the things that we do is that we do support international medical graduates who want to, the, come, to come to the UK and train and we help them to obtain GMC registration. So if we do have any doctors this morning that have done that, then um, you're also very welcome and it's really nice to have you here. Um, and I'm sure you'll see this page. In fact, I know you're going to see this page a lot today. Everyone's um, going to show it to you. Um, but there is a big section on the college website for trainees, um, which you can see here. Um, you will be able to find everything you need. So all of your curricula, your syllabus, your, your um, ARCP guidance, your workplace based assessments, your uh, examination information, everything is there for you. So please do make use of the website and have a look at it um, when you've got a bit of time and start to familiarise yourself with, with everything that's on there. And then just a little bit about what else the college does, because uh, although we'll, we'll be focusing very heavily today, obviously, on your training period, um, the, the college has about 60 employees and we have four other directorates in addition to the learning directorate. Um, and we do um, do quite a lot of other things that you will actually be able to benefit from straight away as well. Some of you might already know about the work that we do to support undergraduate and foundation doctors that are interested in a career in pathology. And we have a range of activities and programmes going on to make sure that we can capture anyone that's interested in, in pathology as a career and, and, and try and encourage them to apply to specialty training. In addition to that, one of the big pieces of work that we do is to undertake workforce surveys, which gathers evidence about the pathology workforce. Um, and more often than not, that identifies that we often need more resource in our specialties, more people um, and perhaps you know, other things as well. And so then what the college does is uses that information, other information that we gather to lobby government and others to advocate for pathology services across the UK, um, which means, you know, um, asking for more investment um, in order that the pathology services can be properly supported. Um, as you progress through your career and you become a consultant, we provide a really good uh, CPD portfolio and also support for revalidation. Um, and there are guidelines, data sets and the quarterly bulletin, and you will be able to access all of those straight away as a, a trainee that's registered with the college and make use of those. Um, there's also lots of other things here. Um, conferences and webinars is the other thing that you will um, you know, have information about and you'll be able to come to any uh, courses or conferences that the college does. Um, but as you can see, that's just a, a small range of the activity that, that the college undertakes. So then just turning to the other organisations that are involved in, in your training, and you can see that from this um, diagram that the college interacts at every level, starting with the General Medical Council, obviously then also with the postgraduate deaneries and LEPBIs, and then the, the local education providers, the training programmes. Just talking a little bit about the General Medical Council, so obviously you'll all be registered with them and you'll be aware of the General Medical Council, but we are also um, 
our, our curriculum and examinations and, and our assessments all have to be approved uh, by the GMC. They are our regulator. So when we are designing curricula or examinations or assessments and making changes to those, we can't publish anything to the trainees and the trainers and so forth until the GMC have approved them. Um, and these two documents here are the documents that set out the standards that we must meet. Um, the new curricula that I've already mentioned incorporate the generic professional capabilities framework that you'll see on the screen here. Um, and this has had to be incorporated into every medical um, postgraduate curriculum in the country. So not just for pathology, um, but for surgery and obs and gynae and uh, all different specialties. And that is the framework of capabilities that every doctor in the country um, has to meet. Um, these these uh, standards are quite exacting. It's, it takes us quite a while to, to get through the process and to make sure that we're able to meet all of the standards. Um, but as I say, luckily, we've just been through that process for chemical pathology. The other role that the General Medical Council have, though, is that they also oversee um, the implementation of the curricula that the colleges publish. Um, and the implementation of curricula is the responsibility of the deaneries. So they're the ones that will take our curriculum and design their training programmes for delivery locally. And then the GMC will check that they are implementing them appropriately and that there are appropriate um, processes and systems in place. Um, and it's this document that, that underpins those. So you don't you can have a look at these documents if you'd like to, um, but they're there just for, for your reference if, if you're interested to have a look at them. Also, just to mention that one of the things that the GMC undertakes and takes very seriously is the national training surveys. There's one for trainees and one for trainers on an annual basis, and the GMC then publish those results um, and they're looked at and, and acted upon. And the results can be looked at in a number of different ways. So by specialty, nationally, regionally, by uh, deanery, all sorts of things. So it's a, it's a really useful resource and, and helps the GMC to identify um, any common issues in training and things that might need to be addressed. So again, just a recommendation that when it comes along, please make sure you complete it. Uh, and then just finally, really talking a little bit about the deaneries and the LEPB. So you can see along the top here, starting with Health Education England, these are the four statutory education bodies in the UK. Um, uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland also um, act as sort of deaneries as well. But un sitting under Health Education England are a number of regional deaneries um, in England itself. And I've just listed very, very broadly, and I'm sure there's a lot more work that goes on th than that, but very broadly um, what the role of the deaneries is. Um, so on a day to day basis, you will have obviously lots of contact with your, your deanery, your educational supervisor, your training programme director. As I've said, they're the ones that are going to be organising your programme, um, making sure that your training meets the requirements of the curriculum. Um, just also to mention um, the really importantly, the deanery is the organisation that will um, uh, arrange your ARCP for you. So they will um, set it up and let you know when it is and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, they will also issue you with your national training number as well. So finally, then, just to um, outline who you can contact in the college for all of the different things. We do have individual named people that you can contact. So you've met Jenny and Sandra already and you'll meet a few other members of the team this morning. Um, but if you send your emails to these inboxes, you, uh, you will be able to get a good response. So if you have any queries about registering with the college, about the curriculum, the syllabus, the ARCP guidance, any training advice, and when it comes to your CCT, then you can contact the training department. For the assessment department, if you have uh, questions about the supervised learning events, which is what we've renamed our workplace based assessments, the LEP system and the pathology portal, then the assessment department is your uh, is your go to. And obviously, then when you're getting uh, starting to think about the examinations and the part one and the part two examinations, you will contact the, the exams department. Um, that's a little way off yet, but just something to bear in mind. 
So that's the end of my talk. I hope that's been helpful. If you do have any questions, just a reminder to use the Q&A function and we'll answer those either during the meeting or when we get to the Q&A um, section at the end. But I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Adrian Park, who, as I've said, is the chair of the Chemical Pathology Specialty Training Committee um, so that he can talk to you about the curriculum in much more detail. Thank you very much. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm Adrian Park. I'm a chemical pathology consultant based at Addenbrooke Hospital in Cambridge. Um, and I'm chair, as, as Joe has mentioned, I'm chair of the CHEMPAF CSTC at the uh, college. Uh, so um, uh, welcome is the first thing to say. Um, so my aim today is a, to welcome you, but also talk about the curriculum, um, some of the assessment requirements and the examination requirements. Um, going forward uh, with your training. Um, so what do we want to achieve? So what we want to do is to train you to be consultants who can run, it's over here, a clinical biochemistry laboratory. We want you to train also you to be a consultant who can provide outpatient clinics in lipids, diabetes, nutrition, whether it's under or over nutrition, metabolic bone, um, adult inborn errors of, errors of metabolism uh, on a shared care base with uh, adult inborn error of metabolism positions. So how do we train you? So basically we use, um, we're using a new curriculum and this has been launched from the summer of 2021. Um, some of you certainly should be aware that, um, especially it was previously known, um, there was a, it, the names of the specialty have been quite complicated, uh, but there was part of it was uh, chemical pathology, subspecialty, metabolic medicine. But this has all now been renamed chemical pathology. Um, the training, the curriculum is based on the shape of training report. Uh, and so what we should be providing uh, you is teaching and on the job training to this end to uh, achieve the curriculum aims. So the key thing really to do, and I can't encourage you enough on this, is to look at the RCPATH website. Um, so um, what you need to do is you go to this page here uh, and you look at trainees for trainees. And so what you'll find is you have trainees, training, training by specialty, and you need to click on the link Chemical Pathology 2021. So under Chemical Pathology 2021, uh, you will find, or you should be able to find the Chemical Pathology Curriculum for 2021, the Chemical Pathology Syllabus for 2021, uh, workplace-based assessment information, um, and there, there, there will be videos on Chemical Pathology Curriculum Update from July 2021, uh, with some question and answers listed below. So how do we train you? So it's important, as I said, to refer to the curriculum and the syllabus on the website. Uh, and if you look into this, what you'll see is we have a means of assessing you as the first bit. So the assessments, um, important for your training, there'll be case-based discussions or CBDs, direct observation of practical skills, also known as DOPS, evaluation of clinical management events, uh, ECEs, uh, and Mini, mini clinical evaluation exercises or also known as mini cakes. There are multi-source feedbacks which are obtained from um, which you uh, have to obtain from a variety of uh, professionals uh, and other staffing who you work with throughout the training and um, what you will have this is your assessment is uh, your progress is reviewed annually through the Annual Review of Competence Progression, or ARCP. The ARCP is a really important process arranged by your local deanery, which will help guide your training going forward and seeing that you're actually um, making sufficient progress to continue with your training. And then ultimately, that you have made sufficient progress to complete your training. So curriculum development and assessment. So, um, Around about 10 years ago um, now, a report was published called The Shape of Training. And this led to further development um, work uh, at the GMC, this concept of the Generic Professional Capabilities Framework in 2017. 
These were the drivers for change. Um, and the shape of training principles um, looked at patient population service and provider needs. Um, emergency and acute care and continuity, continuity of care, care in the community, flexible learning, generalism versus specialism, and po this, this concept of post-CCT credentialing. Um, and so the GMC launched this generic professional capabilities framework. So basically, there are sort of nine um, uh, sort of um sorry me um nine sort of generic skills which you need to sort of focus on during your training professional knowledge professional skills professional values and behaviors uh, and you have these other uh, areas here and what you have is and um, the idea of training going forward is very much learning knowing how to start to um uh implement your learning showing how to implement your learning and actually does showing that actually you can do the job uh, and it goes based on this uh, pyramid uh, from novice to expert so how does this translate into chemical pathology so what you have is that um, here would be qualification so after foundation training you get selected um, for core medical training. So you have core medical training. So this would be where you do your postgraduate uh, diplomas like MRCP, for example. Then after that, you get selected uh, into your specialty training, which is five years. And during this time, you need to pass part one and part two of FRC pair. At the end of this, you have CCT. And you continue learning through CPD processing. Um, and in certain circumstances, um, you can develop other skills through this process of post-CCT credentialing. Um, throughout your training, you undertake workplace-based assessments uh, as a means of helping you to see that you're developing your training and making appropriate progress as well. Um, but one comment, I haven't mentioned post-CCT credentialing, but it is something that is important. And I think there is one point which is important to our specialty. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the clinical aspects um, of um, chemical pathology, which you will be trained in, is adult inborn errors of metabolism. And the aim for adult inborn errors of metabolism uh, is to actually teach you to train you up to a level whereby actually you can share care of these patients with um, tertiary referral centers. Uh, so where I am, this would be, with, you might be a consultant, say in Ipswich, but you'd be able to share care with someone um, uh, uh, with the adult inborn errors and metabolism clinic in Cambridge, for example. However, um, there is recognition that actually training needs to occur in, to develop consultants uh, in adult inborn errors and metabolism. And it's viewed certainly where we're, we're viewing it currently is that the process for this potentially is going to be through this business of actually getting additional training uh, after your CCD. And this would be uh, an example of post-CCD credentialing and probably the most relevant uh, for our specialty today. Uh, and I'm obviously happy to discuss that further or so outside of this if, if necessary. But it's just an example of what this is. Um, the final bit there is that once you have CCT, that is your license to practice as a consultant. Um, so capabilities and practice. Um, so basically going forward, you know, it, these are sort of outcomes based assessment. Um, and so you know, the training is going to be very much outcomes based. There is a move within postgraduate medical education towards the assessment of educational outcomes. The outcomes of a training program are to produce doctors who are able to demonstrate that they're competent across a range of activities. Uh, and there's a concept of entrustable professional activities or EPAs, uh, which is gaining momentum globally. Uh, and it's, it's used as a means of determining whether trainees are ready for unsupervised practice. 
So capabilities in practice or SIPs describe a professional task or work within the scope of the curriculum. The SIPs are based on the format of entrustable professional activities. They utilize professional judgment of appropriately trained expert assessors. So going forward, this will be for you, but for your clinical and educational supervisors. They provide a defensible way of forming global judgments on professional performance. In order to complete training, the doctor must demonstrate that they are capable of unsupervised practice in all SIPs as detailed in the curriculum. And this is important. So these are some examples I've got. So, um, so this would be, so the SIP would be communication, teamwork and leadership. So each SIP is further broken down into descriptors. Um, the expected levels of performance, how the SIP is mapped to the relevant generic professional capabilities, and the evidence that may be used to inform entrustment decisions. Okay, so here you can see uh, the category, uh, a bit more detail of the SIP, the descriptors, the GPC, the evidence to perform decisions, and this is where you have it. So this would be you know, the evidence here uh, would be uh, your clinical supervisor, educational supervisor report, multi-source multi -source feedback, um, case-based discussion, mini cases or ECEs, and even management course, for example. So SIPs and descriptors. So each SIP has a set of descriptors associated with that activity or task. These descriptors indicate the minimum level of knowledge, skills, and attitude which should be demonstrated. The descriptors are not a comprehensive list, and there are many more examples that would provide equally valid evidence of performance. And the SIPs are, are split as one to two types. There's generic SIPs. Uh, and so the idea of generic SIPs is that these are applicable to all specialties, all disciplines. Uh, so that actually, if going forward you wanted to change specialty, you'd already have training in generically. So that would count in a different specialty, for example. So generic SIPs would be able to function successfully with NHS organizational and management systems, able to deal with ethical and legal issues related to clinical practice, communicates effectively and is able to share decision-making while maintaining appropriate situational awareness, professional behavior, professional judgment, um, is focused on patient safety and delivers effective quality improvements in care, patient care, able to carry out research and manage data appropriately, able to act as a teacher and clinical supervisor. But also what you'll have is you have specialty SIPs. So these will be specific to chemical pathology, um, and these are listed here. Um, so the assessments um, are based on um, how we assess you, will be the ARCP, the MSF, uh, appropriate MSFs, workplace-based assessments, as I've said. The year one examination you may have heard of that is to be withdrawn. Uh, the FRC path otherwise is to remain unchanged for present, but changes remain under review. Potential changes may occur over your training, which you'll be notified of in due course. Um, so the ARCP is really important, and this is really means that it of, um, I cannot stress how important this is. It's annual. It uses decision aids to assess adequate progression in your training year on year. It's a process by which you will be signed off for adequate progression to become a consultant uh, and is arranged for local deaneries and health education in branches. And the key thing here is it's evidence. This is an evidence-based assessment. And so it's documented, it, I cannot stress enough, it's documentation, documentation, documentation. So you need to be able to document uh, using the LEP system you know, your workplace-based assessments, how you progress with your exams, 
record of teaching attendances and courses. And, and what did you learn? Uh, your participation in audit, uh, you know, record of attendance and presentation entities and reflections, evidence uh, to support other activities mapped to the SIP descriptors and relevant and other relevant activities, statutory and mandatory training, and, and what clinics you've done and so forth as well. Everything needs to be logged. Uh, and all I could say is if it's, if this is very much like a legal process, if it's not documented, in essence, it hasn't occurred. So it's really important. Um, and um, where, where trainees can come unstuck, it's just not documenting. And, and there's processes to try and uh, help you with that, but it, it, is, it will make your life easier if you appreciate the need to collate your evidence in a timely manner before each ARCP. Uh, and belate, you know, don't all leave it to the last second because that's where you tend to run into problems. Um, so the next bit of this is um, there's two bits to this slide. There's this business of entrustment levels. So this is your specialty SIPs, um, and this is where you are. So stage one training. So selection, uh, and this is where you are in the chemical path training. So basically, uh, you have uh, these level descriptors. So level one, entrusted to observe only, no execution. Level two, entrusted to act with direct supervision. Level three, entrusted to act with indirect supervision. And level four, entrusted to act and supervise. So what you have here is um, your selected into the specialty. Um, so these are the levels of entrustment you have at, at this stage. That makes sense. So you just map it across this. Um, after ST5, um, there's a critical progression point. You know, this is where by this stage you need to be completing FRC Path Part 1. That is critical to enter ST6. Um, so then ST6, your uh, entrustment levels have gone up. And um, by ST7, basically, which is what you would expect. If you're to be a consultant, you should be entrusted to act and supervise across the specialty SIPs. Um, and then obviously then the next critical progression point is this business of CCT. Yeah. At the end of training, you have to get CCT to become a consultant. So there's critical progression points, which I've just mentioned. Um, the left is the learning environment for pathology trainees and which you'll hear more about a little later on, but you have to use it at all times. This is um, the means of how your documentation of, of all your activities is documented and um, the source by which we you are assessed at ARC fees. Uh, and so this is a bit more of the uh, new lab platform for which I'll, you'll hear a bit later on. Um, so just to continue on this, so how do we train you? So we have examinations. So the part one is MCQ based and part two is three modules. Um, so if you look at um, under training and you look under examinations, examinations by specialty, you need to go to clinical biochemistry here. Uh, and you'll see the details on the clinical part one examination uh, and gives you information about it. And there will be some um, uh, more comments, but there'll be some example questions there as well. With part two, um, you'll see again the details about part two. So the module one is a practical skills module and tells you about this. Uh, the communication skills has been removed. Uh, you'll have the clinical scientific and management skills module, is paper three, and an oral examination. And then module three is a written component module, which is a dissertation, which needs to be submitted. So typically how training works, how this all comes together, is that in years one to two, you focus on clinical biochemistry 
and acquire the knowledge for FRC part, part one. And ideally, I would say take, aim to take FRC part, part one and completion of your second year. And generally speaking, you should be aiming to do one to two clinics a week. Year three onwards, again, it's continuing laboratory training with regards to FRC path. Consider application for PhD if applicable. Uh, consider your clinical training and, and how to, uh, what you want, you know, where, where you think you need to go with this. And, co and continue, continue training, clinical training. Post FRC path part two, it's really aimed to try and uh, acquire any specialist training, laboratory or clinical that you, you need uh, in where you think you want to go with your career. Um, so coming up to hopefully the last few couple of slides here, it's just to highlight that yeah, effectively, this is your training. We want you to be the best you can be. We want you to enjoy your training. Uh, and you know, we want you to succeed and become successful, capable, and competent colleagues. And that's really important. Um, but also, we want to improve on what we do, and we want feedback from you. Your, your training experiences are crucial to the success of postgraduate pathology education, to future curriculum design, and future service and patient needs. Do talk and get involved with the Trainees Advisory Committee. Um, and please do feedback to the Kempath Specialty Training Committee. You know, we, we want to hear from you. We want to get your training as good as we can do for you um, for the reasons above. So just to wrap up, welcome. Um, I've discussed the curriculum assessments and examinations. Um, and really speaking, the next bit of you, you, your thing would be to register with the college and look at the specialty website. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adrian. That was that was great. Um, next, we have Michael Gillett, who works in the assessment department at the college. Um, he's going to um, give you a brief demonstration of the LEP system. Um, don't worry if you um, can't remember all of it. Um, as we've said, all of these uh, sessions are going to be put on the college website, so you'll be able to go back to it um, hopefully when it's up next week. So over to you Michael. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michael Gillett, I'm the Assessment Administrator at the College. I was going to start sharing my screen. Okay, um, so this is the College homepage rcpath.org and this is where you will access the uh, LEP system which stands for Learning Environment for Pathology Trainees. Um, before I give you a quick demonstration, I'll just give you a, a slight bit of background. Um, it's the e-portfolio that you will use to record um, your progress throughout each year of training. Um, it's used for the recording of all your workplace-based assessments, um, including your MSFs. Uh, and the system will also support the annual review of competence progression process, um, as Dr. Park said earlier. Um, and it also provides your educational supervisor's structured report, um, which is also known as the ESSR. Uh, and this is a document that will give a snapshot of a trainee's year of training. Um, I will now give you a quick demonstration on how to use the platform, uh, but do note we are currently producing some instructional videos uh, for trainees on how to use uh, the platform in a bit more depth. Uh, these are going to come out during autumn, um, but before they are available and, and even after, uh, the assessment department is always available um, to reach out to if you need any help. Uh, and as Joe showed you earlier, I was, uh, Email address is assessment at rcpath.org and a little bit later in the demonstration, I'll show you another way uh, in which you can get in touch with us. Uh, so if you, uh, before logging in, uh, just if you just click into the new lab system, it will bring in the member login page for you. Uh, you'll have your college registered email address and password. Um, and if you have registered already uh, you should have been able to set this up already uh, i'm going to use a dummy record um, for the purpose of this video 
and we'll just wait for it to log in. Okay, um, so you will see here on this page the type of access that you have to let. Um, each of you will just show as trainee at first. Um, and then as you get past your first year of training, uh, you will also receive assessor access um, as you will be able to access an assessor for junior trainees. So if you press continue to access the home page, however, uh, before you get onto the home page, uh, when you log in for the first time, you will have a different page that will ask you to select your educational supervisor and training program director. Uh, without doing this, uh, you won't be able to get any further. Once you've selected them, uh, you will be able to get in. You can also set your head of school um, if there is one, and, and you know that is uh, straight away. Um, and then your ARCP external representatives will be given to you by your deanery. They may not be given them to you yet, so you can leave it blank at first. Um, these are all the names of just college staff um, for the purpose of this demo. Okay, um, so this is the let's home page. Uh, the blue bar at the top is the navigation menu. Um, so you have um, different options up here, which I'll show you a bit more depth uh, later on. Uh, the release tab is somewhere else where you can uh, set your relationships. You can also do that uh, just by clicking them, clicking into them here. So if you did need to change your educational supervisor during the year, you can click into the drop down menu uh, and change them. Uh, the alerts menu is the section where uh, any alerts such as let downtime uh, would show. Um, for instance, if we were updating the system, there may be a period of let downtime during the morning um, and they will show here. Any tasks uh, requiring any sort of epic bond, any items uh, requiring your attention will show underneath the tasks bar. And uh, the LEP system also allows for correspondence between all LEP users in the messages section. And as already shown you, this is your training card um, with your relationships on. It also shows your year of training, uh, your ARCP date, um, which will be given to you by your deanery. And this is the progress bar, uh, which shows the number of completed assessments and the requirements for your training year. So as you can see um, on this dummy record, uh, we have one case-based discussion completed of the indicative number of six. And uh, here we've just got one uh, dots completed as well. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna go into on the navigation menu are these three horizontal bars up here that are better known as the burger menu. And if you click into profile. Um, as the college is a single sign-on, you'll only be able to change your email address uh, by notifying us or by doing it on the college website. Um, and then once you do this, uh, the LEP system will be updated the next, next working day. Um, so that's how you're able to change your LEP registered email address. Um, do you know you can also um, upload a photo for your profile. We haven't actually uh, got one for this dummy record, as you can see. Um, it's not mandatory, but if you do wish to uh, upload a photo, everyone with viewing access, uh, which are those relationships that you selected on your training card, uh, they'll be able to see your photo as well. And then if you scroll down to the portfolio user details, this uh, anticipated completion date, and your training will be pre-populated along with your speciality, uh, specialty, I beg your pardon. And then uh, the GMC number um, will also be pre-populated if you have it. Um, and the NTN number is a mandatory field on your ESSR, which I'll show you later. Um, so you will need to enter this um, when you get it, and that will be provided from your deanery and the admin staff. Uh, when you want to enter your job position and workplace, just go into edit 
and then you can type them in. Um, so I'll now go into the ARCP section and create a list. And the first thing to do in that will be to create uh, an ARCP. Uh, here's one we created earlier. And um, to create your ARCP, you'll just simply click into the Create tab. And uh, you'll need to enter these dates. And as I said earlier, the deanery or let the admin staff will uh, provide you with the ARCP date. However, if they have not done it yet and you uh, do not know it, you can enter a fictitious date um because you can change this later on the uh, arcp days do tend to come around may and uh, so i'll set that for may 2023 next year uh, and then do note these dates here uh, cover the whole training year uh, quite often trainees can put the two date as the date of their arcp uh, when actually the uh, two date should cover the, the whole training year so uh, for this year, I will do the training dates for this training year. I beg your pardon. I need to uh, move the uh, boxes. Oh, there we go. Right, I can see where I'm going now. Uh, 2023, and then we'll put the end of July in. Um, that's from, I uh, beg your pardon, that should be in the two date. Uh, so we'll do the wrong date as the 1st of August this year for the training uh, year. And then the end date will be the end of July 2023. There we go, we got there. Um, the additional details section uh, is any um, additional details um, that you need to put in um to let your educational supervisors or ARCP external representatives know um you may not have anything to put in here but if any of these dates uh, have been impacted by anything uh, you can just stick uh, that in there um, and then of course you can just press save for the purpose of this demo I'm just going to back out this one and not create it Okay, um, now I'll go on to the assessment section, which is one of the most important sections uh, in LEPT. And here, uh, this is a documentation of all your uh, assessments. Uh, so to create a new one, to click into create. Now, um, before we create a workplace-based assessment, let me just speak about the uh, MSFs. Um, as you can see down here, um, it lists uh, SC3 chemical pathology. Uh, this is for uh, first year trainees. Uh, the college will initiate your MSF, um, which means you don't need to create anything down here. It will usually be around February, March time uh, for the chemical pathology trainees. And um, we will create it for you. And then it will appear in your taskbar in your left home page once we've done that and you'll receive uh, an email notification. But to create a workplace based assessment, uh, you will click into this menu here and uh, select an assessor. These lists the previously uh, named assessors that you may have used. Uh, if they're not here, uh, you can go into other, find, and then once you've selected the assessment type, uh, which will go into ECE for the purpose of this, you can click into create assessment and it will then bring up a list of the other assessor names that you can use. If their name is not there, you can uh, nominate them as a guest assessor where you can just put in their details and email address there. For the purpose of this one, I'll just put myself as the assessor and I've already selected ECE. We'll click into create assessment just so I can show you how it looks. Uh, so the top part of the page will be pre-populated, but you can change the date of the assessment as necessary. Uh, and then you will need to enter the assessor status. And then uh, all of these fields marked with the red asterisk uh, are mandatory fields uh, for you to complete. 
Um, and uh, once you've done that, uh, these boxes down here are the feedback boxes um, that the assessor, as you can see here, will have the ultimate ability to amend uh, your comments. Um, but on these forms, um, as you can see, they are they are now uh, marked as mandatory um, on this one, and you will submit to the assessor, or you can save the assessment as a draft as many times if you like, where you can access it from your tasks menu. And once you submit the assessment to your assessor, uh, they of course will either approve or return it to you. Um, and once they've approved it, um, it will then be waiting for your assessment, uh, sorry, for your association in your left homepage. And uh, I will back out of this assessment and show you how that looks if we go back to the home page once uh, the assessor has approved the, uh, the assessment it will appear here as you can see this is a dots but um, it does work on the same basis uh, for each type of assessment uh, once you've completed it it will go to your assessor uh, they will approve it and then it will come back for your association with your capabilities in practice and generic professional uh, capabilities um, as uh, Dr. Park talked about earlier. Um, so you will select here the relevant uh, capabilities in practice. So I will just select uh, a couple for this one. And as you will see, the um, generic professional capabilities will auto populate down here, but do know you can change them uh, if you don't think they're necessary um, to your assessment. And then once you've done that, you can click add. And following this, there will just be one last thing you'll need to do with the assessment, uh, which sometimes uh, can easily be forgotten, um, but you need to associate it with your ARCP so that it will show um, in your annual review of competence progression at the end of your training year. And here you just click into options on the landing page, go in here, and then it will have the available ARCP for you to assign it to. And then once we go back to the home page, uh, we should see an extra DOPS completed. Okay, um, and then following this, uh, let me just find where we are. Um, Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned, all assessments will work on that basis, um, although the actual pages that you'll fill out will vary slightly. Um, it all works in the same on the same basis that um, it will go to the assessor and then come back for your association. Um, I'll just give you a very, very quick overview on the other um, parts of the navigation menu. You've got the training development up here where you can create and list personal activities. And there isn't any here, but you can actually add this welcome day as a personal activity, click into create, and then um, you'll be able to add it. And if you do get stuck doing that at all, um, as I mentioned, we do have the instructional videos uh, coming out and in the instructional video that will be available in autumn uh, for creating a personal activity. Uh, we have actually done one for this um, welcome day. So you'll be able to see how to do that in a bit more depth. But then, um, it is, it is fairly straightforward if you click into create and you can fill out the, the relevant uh, fields in it. The training rotations are where you can record all your training rotations uh, throughout your training. Um, so if you go on to a rotation at a different hospital for a couple of weeks, um, you can record it here. And I do know that um, these will auto populate in your educational supervisor structured report, which I'll also show you shortly, uh, along with the training, uh, sorry, the personal activities, which I showed you there. Uh, again, with the training rotations, just click into create and fill out the relevant details. And then uh, the resources tab you can use for any documents that you wish to upload for your ARCP panel to see at the end of the year. And uh, these can include examination results letters, or maybe a document that might contain a discussion that you have with your educational supervisor. 
Okay, um, so yeah, I'll quickly just show you how to create the educational supervisor structure report. Um, so you'll do one of these each year for each ALCD. Uh, when you want to set that up later in the year, you can just click down here into progress on your ALCD and quite simply just click into create ESR. Of course, uh, I want to create the ESSR and you understand the ESSR content will be locked after it's sent off and approved. Click into create ESSR and then uh, you'll have the pre-populated information up here. And as you can see, there'll be the parts where you will need to fill out um, and it will also list your workplace-based assessments. By the time you get to the educational supervisor structured report, there'll be a lot more down here. Obviously, we just haven't got uh, too many assessments listed on this dummy record. Uh, any examinations results, if relevant, will also show. Um, and there's the various sections down here where you can put training comments in on any of these additional fields. And again, um, it's the same process. You can uh, submit it and send it to your educational supervisors, uh, your educational supervisor, and they will approve or uh, return it to you. So in a nutshell, um, if I just come back to the home menu, in a nutshell, uh, that's the basics of the Let's e portfolio. Uh, I know it was a very quick uh, overview and, and some of it might not have, have stuck, but um, as uh, Joe um, and Nikki have both mentioned uh, today, there'll, there'll be the um, Q&A uh, chat box. So please ask any questions now and we can ask the, answer them during the, the meeting or um, at the end of the meeting. And um, otherwise, if you don't want to ask now or think of something later, uh, you can email us at uh, the assessment inbox, assessment at rcpath.org. Uh, or the other way you can contact us under this help tab, you can click into the report issue section. Uh, and this is just basically another way of sending us an email. It will come straight through to the assessment inbox and you can attach any files uh, for instance screenshots uh, if you have got any issues um, so that is the end of the demonstration so i will um pass it back to show brilliant thank you michael that was really helpful um okay so um our next talk is a, a, just a very broad overview of the college examinations by dr sanjeev manik who is the clinical director of examinations unfortunately he couldn't be with us today but he's pre-recorded this talk um so louis if i could ask you to show that now thank you the clinical director of examinations probably the last person you wanted to hear from uh, on, on your welcoming day uh, but um, as uh, professor osborne uh, just mentioned that um, uh, we, we there are lots of roles uh, for the college to fulfill uh, for trainees and uh, for consultants and one of the most important ones um, is, is examinations because um, uh, that's one sort of measure of objective measure of um, how your training um, uh, takes place and, and helps you to get to the point where you can uh, report independently and become a successful pathologist. So what I intend to do today is to give you an overview of examinations, uh, no specific details, but just for you to keep this in mind. Um, and as has already been mentioned, uh, lots of information is available uh, on, on the websites, which I'll, I'll refer to again in a, in a moment. Okay, so um, the college provides a lot of information on curricula by specialty and information on examinations by specialty. And this is regularly updated as um, things change or new information is, is gathered. Um, and we, we provide the up-to-date information um, because we, we obtain this from various sources. So we work very closely with the GMC uh, who, who are in charge of approving curricula, but also um, uh, examination formats and delivery uh, of examinations. Uh, we as a college have to also work very closely with other Royal Colleges. Uh, so there's an Academy uh, of Medical Royal Colleges. So we 
um, have lots of meetings with them, especially uh, where exams are, are concerned. Um, we get, gather our information from all of you via the Trainee Advisory Committee. And quite often we do put out surveys uh, to gather information from all of you and also from the uh, consultant workforce um, in case we need to um, look at potential changes to uh, exams content and, and format of delivery. So all these, uh, as and when this happen, uh, are updated uh, on the website and um, most often by specialty, although there are many generic things that are also put out there. So as a college, we not only um, provide examinations in terms of actually uh, forming the exams, but we also standard set them and we quality assure them. So uh, we can then uh, give reassurance to bodies like the GMC that uh, these exams are fit for purpose and they are regularly um, quality assured um, just to make sure that um, they do provide the kind of assessment that is required to fulfill some of the GMC requirements. Um, we also provide feedback to trainees. So uh, this is uh, specific exam related feedback to trainees who may not have succeeded at certain parts of the exams just in, uh, so that they can uh, be helped um, when they reattempt uh, examinations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, one thing to say is that the exams are of very high standard and uh, have international recognition to the point that um, many of our candidates uh, do come from abroad. Uh, and because many of the exams now uh, also take place online, uh, we have a large contingent of uh, candidates that um, are international um, and we are also beginning to uh, administer the exams uh, uh, internationally uh, where it is uh, feasible and possible so that um, uh, we can facilitate exam delivery for candidates who may find it difficult to travel um, to United Kingdom. So as Dr. Osborne already mentioned, we uh, are responsible for 17 different specialties and as a result not only for the training aspects of them but also for the assessment and examinations uh, aspects as well. So we are able to provide examinations for all the specialties at different parts uh, as required. So the, the medical only type specialties um, are uh, hematology, histopathology and then um, the more specialized areas within that um, would be forensic pathology, neuropath, PED path, uh, autopsy and cervical cytology. So we would have exams for all of these as well. And then there are some smaller specialties or super specialties uh, where uh, we have fewer candidates uh, on each sitting session, but uh, we will ensure that exams are provided as and when uh, they need to be provided. And then there are some specialties where we also do uh, cater for clinical scientists who are working towards becoming consultant clinical scientists and the exams that they have to do. And many times the exams are similar to the medical um, uh, workforce but also some of them are geared towards um, their specialty um, so that they can become important members of uh, pathology teams around the country. So clinical biochemistry, genetics, medical microbiology, virology, immunology uh, fall under that sort of um, domain. And then there are certain other ones where it's more based uh, around clinical scientists um, uh, and we are responsible for their examinations and we would have to work closely with the organizations that um, uh, actually formulate their training uh, but rely on the RC path to provide the examinations for them. So basically where does the examinations fit um, in, in any one specific curriculum? Um, it's It has to go hand in hand with um, what's often termed as workplace-based assessments or any other types of assessments that take place regularly. And the examinations 
are designed such that they happen at certain points in training just to make sure that um, sufficient knowledge has been obtained as well as sufficient skills. So they, they're not exclusive um, to uh, progression in training, uh, but they, have, they are very important parts uh, of the training and um, always have to be taken together with other forms of assessment. So if we, you will have seen this uh, Miller's Pyramid uh, many times, and if not, you will see that from time to time. Uh, basically, um, you know, we, we are trying to sort of go from bottom to top. So gathering knowledge, um, then understanding this knowledge and, and trying to apply it um, and, and do it in such a way that you can show the competence for it. Um, and then actually, uh, as you reach the end of your training or towards the end of your training, you can actually show the performance of what you have gathered uh, during the years of training. So um, in very simple terms, the, the part one exam uh, is to test your knowledge, basically. So that comes fairly early uh, in your training. And then the part two covers the sort of understanding and competence aspects of it. So you not only show that um, you know, but you, you also show how uh, you apply that knowledge. And then finally, as I said, as it goes in hand in hand with other forms of assessment, um, you can reach the top of the pyramid in that aspect. So we do have, a, uh, in, in most specialties, a, a period of um, residual training after the part two exam, uh, which, which is by no means an exit exam, uh, so that um, the remaining training is, consolidates uh, the uh, previous training but also can focus on areas which uh, need to be covered. Uh, and sometimes that information is available from the performance in, in the part two examination. So if you take cellular pathology, for instance, uh, the part one uh, is, is the first uh, milestone to, to cover. And then after a couple of more years of training, part two. Um, and then there are uh, additional modules that people can um, can enter and, and take uh, if they want to subspecialize a little bit more in autopsy. So then we provide a certificate examination for that. Um, and also, uh, although it's a uh, um, small science now, the cervical cytopathology, we still are able to provide examinations for those who want to uh, take that up as, as a future career. So another certificate exam. And then the part two examinations can also be um, slanted towards the specialties that uh, have their own CCT, like neuropath, peat path, and, and forensic pathology. And uh, those who want to specialize in dermatopathology, after having done the part one and part two FLC path, can also then do further training in, in that area. And um, we provide a diploma exam for that. Um, similar overarching structure for other specialties like for instance part one and part two in clinical biochemistry uh, which is to be combined with metabolic medicine in due course um, and uh, in infection training as well so um, we have a part one exam in frc path in infection training which um, um, for the medical people who want to do microbiology and virology then go on to take the part two in that uh, or after obtaining the what we call the CICE certification um, can progress on to infectious diseases. So we are also responsible for providing the um, combined infection certificate examination as well. And something like that would um, require us to work very closely with the Royal College of uh, Physicians um, and other colleges. So just a broad overview of what the part one exam is. Generally, it's a, it's, it's a written uh, examination in terms of uh, MCQs, and that's the, one of the reasons why we are able to provide it uh, online. Um, and that's something that um, we managed to achieve during uh, 2020 uh, when um, things were changing very fast as far as exam delivery were concerned. Um, so the idea is to sort of keep to the online uh, delivery format. Um, and so these uh, are basically MCQs in CAMPATH uh, and histopathology or, or cellular pathology. Uh, we have a combination of MCQs and, and 
EMQs. Um, and uh, in combined infection training, we have um, MCQ and, and short um, single best answer type papers as well. And, and using MCQs gives us a, a chance to test uh, broad uh, knowledge and in-depth knowledge at the same time. So we do provide sample questions um, and, and limited amounts of past papers. Um, and as I said, you can uh, look at um, your specialty um, and, and see what, what's up there uh, for your specialty to, to guide you. A lot of times uh, we are asked as to when to sit the part one. Um, and, and I would say as a, as a generic comment that um, it's important that you do this when you feel that you are ready for it or your education supervisor does. And, and, and I always uh, tend to say that no need to rush into examinations just because you think, you know, a milestone has to be covered. Um, it's, it's more important that you are prepared for this examination so that you have every chance of succeeding in the first attempt. So normally uh, the part one, because it's testing knowledge, is, is around sort of one and a half to two and a half years. So for instance, in, in cellular pathology, uh, with, uh, with the on incoming new curriculum, um, it is regarded that perhaps at about 13 months, one can consider um, taking the part one examination. And then what is the PASS standard? Um, so we, we were obviously wanting to see if the trainees have reached a level of knowledge and understanding expected at around two years into the program. Um, and w once we can see that the candidates possess that kind of knowledge, um, uh, you know, they, they pass and then they progress to higher stages of training uh, where they consolidate the knowledge parts and now uh, sort of focus on applying that knowledge. And how do we determine the past standard? Um, there are many methods available, but generally we tend to use the ANGOF method for the part one especially. And although we don't have as many examiners as these sitting in any one session, it feels very much like that in that uh, every single question is scrutinized um, and assessed, uh, not only for its reliability, uh, but for its uh, testing uh, capability as well. And we um, do this independently amongst examinations, um, examiners to see how well a candidate might perform on any one um, a question. So we then um, have a range of opinions from a range of uh, examiners and all that's put together in a uh, statistical fashion that uh, will not only give us a pass mark for each question, but then for the all exam uh, in, um, in, in total. So we, we have to do this at every uh, occasion that when a new paper is set. Moving on to part two, basically, as I said, you, you're not only uh, testing the application of knowledge, but also demonstrating uh, a certain degree of skills as well, depending on what specialty uh, you're in. Um, and, and the exams are designed to test um, these aspects of your training. Uh, the pass one pass rates um, generally don't fluctuate too much, but it does obviously depend on, on cohorts in, in the training um, and also the number of people, uh, candidates entering, say, from the international uh, side of things as well. So um, there is a bit of a variation, but generally what I'm showing here uh, are sort of 2019 figures where um, we have sort of more data because last year many things were slightly skewed. Uh, although, as, you know, interestingly and surprisingly, the pass rates did not deviate uh, too much uh, from this. Uh, but for instance, if I take histopathology, which is my area, the, the part one pass rate is in the sort of seven, early 70%. Um, so that's the kind of thing um, we see from year to year. Part two, because it's testing uh, more in the way of uh, skills and, uh, and application of knowledge, uh, you do tend to see lower pass rates in these and these can fluctuate and there is quite often uh, a wide range. Uh, but what I'm showing you here are the average uh, pass rates over the past few years. 
I did mention uh, feedback. And what's very important to understand here is that whenever a candidate uh, is unsuccessful in any part uh, of the examination, uh, the idea of providing as detailed feedback as possible is to uh, help with future learning. So it provides a uh, summary of the performance. Uh, it's not necessarily a guidance uh, on the steps required to pass at the next attempt. Uh, what it does do is it, it shows the, uh, the candidates where they uh, were not quite up to standard or um, were a little bit suboptimal. And, and quite often it might be just one or two areas that they need to focus on. So when we provide this kind of detailed feedback, they know where to focus on for the second attempt. So it should not be used uh, as, as a sole uh, basis for preparing for future exams. Uh, it should be used in conjunction with other evidence as well. So it may be that um, uh, the feedback is then discussed with educator supervisors, clinical supervisors, uh, or at ARCPs, and uh, focus training is then put into place to ensure that uh, all the gaps are then uh, adequately covered uh, before the exam is attempted again. <clears throat> so for the part one exams, because they're mostly MCQs or EMQs, we tend to give um, the candidate score and pass score only. Um, it, it would be quite difficult to try and give uh, feedback for every single question uh, in, in that aspect. But even, even giving the candidate score does give you a fair idea of how close or how far away you are from uh, passing um, and, and gives you an, a measure of um, uh, whether the next attempt should be in six months or in 12 months as, as such. In most exams, uh, especially the part one, we, we do provide it twice a year. And most exams, part two also, we do provide it twice a year. There'll be some specialties where the exams are annual. For the part two exams, uh, there are lots of components involved. So we tend to give uh, feedback according to the components. So um, where candidates have passed, we'll just say, you know, they've passed certain uh, areas, but where they have uh, failed, uh, we will then give them uh, a summary of the reasons for the failure. So that gives a very good feedback to supervisors and the trainee themselves um, to uh, focus on, on certain aspects of the training before they attempt the exam again. So in terms of what are keys to your success, obviously the training program is extremely important um, so that you know you are trained by experienced trainers who although also have to go undergo their own training to be uh, able to be educational supervisors. Um, you have clear educational objectives which are then also measured uh, annually um, and st structured learning experience um, throughout your training period and, and regular appraisal and um, broad ranging experience across the entire breadth of the curriculum. Um, and, and the FRC PATH exams are designed to make uh, assessment at certain milestones to make, ensure that uh, all that you need to gain from your training program according to the curriculum is being gained. Um, and also very important aspects are local, regional and, and national training sessions in your training program. So again, reiterating that your part one exam uh, is, is testing knowledge. So take a long run up. Uh, it's very difficult to cram things into the last couple of months before your exam. I think uh, what's important here is that you gather the knowledge as you go along. Um, uh, and also looking at uh, ways of um, picking up the knowledge. And there's a lot of resource out there, um, but this is what your trainers will give you guidance on and, and adopt a systematic approach. So it's almost like saying, you know, doing a, a certain amount uh, on a regular basis so that when you come up to, to the exam, you basically are re revising uh, instead of actually learning for the first time. And very important in most aspects of the pathology subspecialties to correlate your book knowledge with your ongoing day-to-day -day experience. And the more you do that, the easier it is uh, uh, for you to 
uh, recall it and it's, it's, it gets embedded into your system uh, so that uh, regurgitating it becomes uh, very, very easy. And very important to obtain regular feedback from your trainers. So not only in your day-to-day uh, -day practice and day-to-day -day experience, but also no harm in asking uh, for trainers uh, to set you uh, some exams or practice uh, papers and practice questions so that you know uh, how to measure uh, where you stand in, in terms of your training and your preparation for exams. Uh, part two, because it's skills and, and knowledge application, um, it's important to make sure that you cover um, the, the wide ranging experience that you really need uh, with regular feedback from your trainers, uh, which means say for instance in cellular pathology, um, you know, you, you look at a lot of glass slides or uh, nowadays, uh, glass slides and digital slides as well, just to make sure that you, you cover as many entities as possible and are comfortable not only with um, pathology and abnormalities, but you're also comfortable with the wide range of normal appearances of, of tissues. And you can only do that uh, when you tend to see lots of material on a day-to-day -day basis. In other specialties, obviously spend time in, in labs where um, you have to uh, make sure that you, again you cover everything that uh, is provide uh, is supposed to be covered in your curriculum. So basically, optimize all your clinical uh, opportunities. And as I've already said, especially for an approach to part two, get people to set you practical exercises so you are regularly tested and challenged. Um, also practice oral exam technique, but because many of these exams in the part two stage uh, do have uh, oral exam components as well. Um, so you, you do need practice in that too. And as you approach the exams, do mock exams as well. So many of your trainers and education supervisors will be examiners. So they will be able to set their own exam um, and, and give you guidance on, on um, uh, how exams are, are set uh, and should be approached. Um, so do follow their follow that uh, guidance like that. And in many specialties, say again in cellular pathology, there um, are many commercial courses available which you may want to attend. Uh, although the college does not actually badge these at uh, these courses, but we do know that there are many uh, out there that do help to prepare towards the exams. So in terms of concluding thoughts, um, the exams provide a rigorous um, test of cognitive skills. Um, and again, part one, all about knowledge. So taking as much book work and, and journal work as possible. And then part two, applying that and showing that you have obtained the skills uh, to progress in your training. And they exams do have to work together with the other forms of assessment. Uh, in order to test, uh, test and sample all aspects of the curriculum. So candidates who are fully engaged in a well-structured training program have a high probability of success. And, and I, I should say that those who are well-prepared um, take it in their stride, uh, do follow this approach of a long run-up um, and, and uh, regularly apply their knowledge to ongoing practice do tend to pass first time uh, in both parts of one and two. Um, the website uh, has, has already been mentioned uh, by Dr. Osborne. Um, you will find your information for trainees in that and then within that uh, you have uh, specialty information as well. And then there's also, as, I, as I'm showing here, uh, examinations by specialty. So that's where you'll find regulations generic as well as uh, specialty specific and, and um, sample questions as well. So thank you very much. Hopefully uh, that hasn't frightened anyone, but important to know uh, that during the course of your training, you will have um, these assessments uh, as, as milestones to, to cross over. Uh, but hopefully I've given you some degree of guidance and an overview as to how to approach them. Thank you very much.
great. OK, um, so we are on to our final talk now. We are running a little ahead of time, so we probably will finish early. But if there are questions, again, just to reiterate, you can um, pop them in the Q&A box um, and we can answer those. So um, if anything, uh, if there's anything that you're not clear about still, do remember to do that. Um, so our final speaker today is Dr Matthew Clark, who's the chair of the Trainee Advisory Committee. Um, and as I've said, um, Matthew and I are uh, in regular contact discussing a range of issues um, concerning training. But Matthew will talk through with you um, the support that the Trainee Advisory Committee can also provide you during your training. So over to you, Matthew. Thanks very much, Joe, and good morning to you all. Um, it's really nice to e meet you. Um, a shame we're not doing this face to face, but hopefully I'll get to meet you at um, a forthcoming meeting at the college sometime soon. Um, I hope you're all enjoying uh, the first few weeks of your, your training. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about my role as chair of the Trainees Advisory Committee, as Joe mentioned, uh, but also just to mention, I'm also the chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges Trainee Doctors Group, where I can feed in um, discussions about pathology and also wider training issues that are affecting um, all the medical and surgical specialties as well. So um, it's an opportunity for us to tie in together with other, um, the other specialties and other work that's going on as part of the Academy. So first of all, a big welcome to you to Pathology. I'm very pleased to have you with us. Um, some of you I may have met actually at various engagement events in the, over the previous few years um, that you might that might have been what inspired you to actually um, get involved in the specialty. But it's great to have you. And I hope you're, as I said, I hope you're enjoying the first few weeks of it. It's a very steep learning curve to begin with. There's lots to learn. Um, no one expects you to know about it, all, all about the specialty to start with. Um, but uh, listen, learn, and um, you'll acquire a huge amount of knowledge um, by the end of your first year of training and beyond as well. I can definitely reiterate that you've made the right choice as well. Um, I transitioned from surgery into pathology and I haven't looked back since and I really enjoy getting up and going into work every day and hopefully you'll, you'll have the same feeling as well. Um, I think we've all been experiencing some quite challenging um, circumstances over the last few years, whether that's with the pandemic, um, but also the reinstitution of the services after, in, in the aftermath of the pandemic as well. So it's been a highly pressured environment that you may have been working in, um, depending on what specialties you've been in as well. But this, this increased pressure that everybody's experiencing in the moment does translate through to pathology because we're, of course, involved in so much and central to so much of healthcare. So a big thank you from me personally for all the help and what you've done and hard work that you've done over these last few years to actually contribute to this ongoing ongoing effort and that you will continue to do as part of your new role in pathology as well. Um, and just to bear in mind that because of these increased pressures at the moment, training may look a little bit different to usual, um, but we're very much active in the training recovery program at the moment and trying to make sure that everything is, gets back on track and that resources are available to you to help um, provide you with what you need to get through your training as well. Um, so do chat with your educational supervisors or training program directors and also your other colleagues as well if, you're, if you feel that you're missing out on anything that you, you need to help you progress. So what is the, the Trainees Advisory Committee? Um, well, it's a committee of trainee representatives that cover all 17 pathology training specialties. And we're a committee, we have over 30 members of our committee, so it's a big committee, um, but that provides a huge amount of diversity, um, whether that's um, people from different specialties at different stages of training and different forms of training as well, including people who are working less than full time. So we've got a really big spectrum of people that provide a huge amount of ideas, thoughts and experience to our ongoing discussions and relationships to training issues. Um, we also have training representatives that sit on um, other committees as well. And one of the things that we're really proud of is our, our relationship with the college. The college really value us um, as a committee and are really keen to get our views and opinions about think projects that they're working on, but also to feed into the wider work of the college also. So we have representatives that sit on the examinations committee, medical examiners committee, um, also the digital pathology committee. There's a diversity and inclusion network where we have representation as well. And also individual training representatives that sit on the specialty advisory committee um, posts as well. So we feed into an awful lot of the work of the college and so are really central to um, it, the ongoing development of a lot of these projects. Um, so that's something we're really pleased about. And each one of these representatives actually provides a report for the Trades Advisory Committee meeting about the relevant information that's coming from these meetings so we can all review what the progress is, if there are any particular challenges that we potentially can support as a committee at the moment and how we can move things forward as well. 
Um, we tend to meet twice a year. Um, at, the, at the moment, they're just virtual meetings, um, but we have contact throughout. So although there's two meetings, we're working throughout the entire year um, on training related um, issues and progress as well. And as I mentioned, really valued by the college. And we have a really close working relationship um, with the senior members of the executive team of the college as well. So what is the actual role of the Trainees Advisory Committee? Well, we're here to represent every single one of you. Um, that's a really important thing, that we are your channel and communication link um, between the college and yourselves. Um, we can put forward any concerns or queries to the college that you might have. Hopefully things will progress through for you um, very straightforwardly and um, very positively. But of course, we all encounter challenges along the way. And so it's important that you have a portal whereby you can, you can raise these particular issues if you think they're pertinent to do so and so that's what our role is to try and do that um, we also review documents uh, curricula new curricula as they're being developed and provide trainee valuable training input for various different projects that the college are involved with we've been heavily involved in um, work related to the um, the jubilee that the college has recently celebrated but on the other side of things we've been heavily involved in work related to training recovery as well and making sure that uh, provision of resources in the coming years is available where there are particular um, inequalities or deficiencies that trainees are reporting to us as a result of the pandemic um, so this is a there's a wide spectrum of different work that we do but ultimately what we're trying to do is make life easier for trainees training can be a very challenging time but hopefully a really enjoyable one as well but there are challenges to it and it's a lot of hard work um, and can get can be a struggle at times and there may be it may be um, particular challenges along that training route that we can help to smooth out for you and make a bit easier um, and that's why we that's an important role that we have to do that and the college are really keen to hear from us um, about what those might be and really help us to make those changes um, where we can and if you have concerns regarding your training, it's really important that you let us know so that we can try and take it forward. If we don't hear anything from you, then we are assuming that everything is going is, is fine and is going st straight forward to plan, which is what we all hope. And hopefully it will be the same in your case. Um, but if not, don't be afraid to actually feed back to us that there's an issue. Um, and you, there's no stigma associated with this. The college really wants to hear the feedback and value feedback from the trainees um, so that we can make things better for you as well. And the other thing that you can actually contribute to every single one of you is contributions to the trainee section of the college bulletin. It's a really good opportunity to get practice with sort of writing um, to a, a different audiences about issues in pathology or about particular topics that you're interested in in pathology. Um, the editor of the bulletin is frequently looking for um, trainees who may be interested in doing book reviews as well. So I email out as part of my trainee updates um, requesting trainee input to these, these aspects. So if you want to give it a go or would be interested in doing that, then do get in touch um, and we can try and take that forward for you. Um, the other thing uh, is that we have our own dedicated section on the website, so you can follow, you can search on the college website for the Trainees Advisory Committee, and alongside information about the committee and those who are on it, you will also find different trainee resources that may provide information and guidance to help you through your help you through your training. And it might be a good idea at this stage, being so early in your training, to have a look at that now and see what the sort of resources that there are available to you. We're in the process of, as a committee of actually drafting some more material, which will be hopefully going up in the coming months as well. So do keep an eye out um, for those new resources that are on their way as well. And this is just a, a subset of the committee representatives. So as, a, as mentioned, I'm the chair of the committee. Um, Dr. Rachel Rummery is a paediatric trainee representative and she's the vice chair. But you can see we've got a wide range of different representatives covering all the specialties of pathology, including lay representation as well, and also those trainees involved in research. So lots of different representation and you can contact any of these trainees directly, um, depending on what issue or any, any particular aspect that you want to discuss with them. So how does the actual committee work and what, what's the sort of what's our remit of how we how we um, gather go about these different projects that we're involved in? Well, as I said, we meet twice a year and that's usually in May and November and 10 weeks in advance. Um, you will have an email from Jenny um, inviting you to submit questions or queries via a portal that's open up on the college website. Um, you can submit as many questions or queries as you like, and these will come directly to us. 
um, for review within our meeting. But in advance of this, we are th these questions are collated and are given to Joe Brinklow, the Director of Learning, and also San Dr. Sanjeev Manik, the Director of Examinations, who you've just heard from as well, who kindly formulate responses to these, these queries. And we have submitted the responses in advance of our meeting, and we can chat about them amongst uh, with the trainee representatives. And then we're very privileged, actually, because uh, we're, we're fortunate to have the college officers actually join us for part of our meeting where we can actually discuss these responses further um, and iron out any particular concerns that we have related to them as well. So we have Joe who joins us. We also have the clinical director of training and assessment, Nikki, Nikki Cohen, and we have the vice president for learning, Dr. Anghara Davies, and we have the director of examinations with us as well. So it's a really fruitful discussion and again, helps to establish the really close link that the committee have with the senior members, members of the college. The trainees have then submitted queries um, and uh, will then receive a response based on um, from based on our discussion and the responses from the officers. Um, and we're also looking at developing a sort of frequently asked questions part of the website as well, so that you may find that one of your queries has actually already been answered in a previous discussion. And we're also lucky to have uh, be joined by our president um, for the meeting as well, who comes to talk to us about the work that he's doing at the moment related to pathology and training. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to feed back to him any particular things that we want him to be aware of or anything we want to get him to get involved with from our, from our viewpoint as well. So so it's a really productive meeting and we're really lucky to have the administrative support from the college in the form of um, Ali Morgan who um, is invaluable in providing the administrative support for the committee and the ongoing work um, that myself and the other members do um, in between our meetings as well and we couldn't do it without her, her support. So what are some of the activities and projects and ongoing work that we've been involved with over the last few years? Well, one of them has been an ongoing anti-bullying and harassment campaign. And many of you will have either experienced this in your training before um, or at medical school. Sadly, it's such a common occurrence nowadays that we, we, we see this. But one of the things that many colleges, well, all colleges have been uniting to do is try and stamp this out of training. And it's, although pathology it is very infrequent occurrences, um, in our view and in the college's view, one incident is far too many and the college has a zero tolerance approach um, to this form of behaviour. And you will be able to see on the college website some of the activities and work that we've done in relation to this and the resource development. But the idea is that this is an ongoing campaign to keep people talking about it so it can't be hidden away. And all trusts and deaneries should have policies in place if any incidents of the, of the bullying and harassment is taking place. So the important message is to feel supported and that if anything does happen, or you witness anything that's untoward, there are people there who will be able to help you and support you going forward with that. The other thing that's um, really hot off the press is the RCPATH Health Education England Pathology Portal, which is a digital learning environment that actually was launched um, uh, uh, on Monday this week, so very hot off the press. It's been launched for the histopathology trainees and those working in cytology and neuropathology and, and autopsy and forensics as well initially. But the idea behind this is that it will be a resource for all pathology specialties. And those resources develop, are being developed for chemical pathology at the moment, as well as haematology and microbiology as well. So every, every specialty will have its own resource list um, on this portal. And it's a digital learning environment which will provide you with active cases where you'll be able to answer questions about it and lots of other learning resources and materials. So it's a really, really exciting venture um, that's been supported and helped developed by Professor Joe Martin and led by Professor Joe Martin, who's one of the, um, former, uh, the former presidents of the Royal College as well. So do keep an eye out for this. Although it's been launched, for, as I said, for a, a subset of trainees to begin with, um, there'll be further developments and releases um, later on and the other, other specialties will feature within this as well. One of the things we also do and very in, actively involved with is wellbeing and support resources um, for trainees. So this was particularly pertinent during the pandemic. Um, so you'll be able to find resources and um, useful links related to this ongoing work on the website as well. And we've also been involved in reporting of errors and mistakes in pathology, and we're heavily involved in Patient Safety Awareness Week, which takes place each year as well. Now, in, in any specialty, errors are going to happen and mistakes will happen to all of us. We're all human beings, and that's 
that's the nature of things. But the important thing is that I think and what's something that pathologists should be proud of is that we're actually open and honest about talking about these mistakes so that not it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's an opportunity for learning to make sure that others don't experience this again. And so what we've tried to do is foster this environment within the trainee setting to gather groups of trainees together to talk openly about these mistakes when they happen and try and work out why and how we can learn from them as well. So this is some other work that we've been doing. And there are a series of videos exploring this that we've put together as a committee on the website that you can view as well. Other things that we've done, um, we're heavily involved in diversity in the college. So myself and uh, other Rachel and other trainees sit on the diversity and inclusion network. So we're really keen to ensure that we, our membership is our, and on our committee is representative of our college membership. And there are lots of ongoing work um, related to this as allied with other colleges and the academy as well. One of the things that some of you may have actually been at was the RCPATH BDIAP Foundation and Undergraduate Taster event, which the committee are heavily involved in the development of. And this is an engagement activity that's designed to um, attract medical students and foundation doctors um, or other doctors and other specialties who may be interested in exploring what a career in pathology can offer you. And some of you on the, on the, in the meeting at the moment may be interested in public engagement, and I would strongly urge you to get involved in this and other projects that the committee are um, involved with. We're always looking for volunteers to help with these things. So if you would like to, do look out for that when we're, we're, we're contacting you about it. Another event for your diaries to put in um, at now is a not in the textbooks study day um, virtual um, conference meeting, which is taking place on the 27th of September. It's open for all trainees in all specialties, at all different stages. And the idea behind it is we have a really detailed curriculum across the different pathology specialties, but there are some things that may not be quite covered quite so well or as easily within our curriculum. And so this study day is designed to help try and cover some of those things. So it's aiming to try and provide you with advice about how to prepare for senior positions um, as a consultant or a scientist um, and also things like mentoring advice how to be a good teacher um, and other things that you will find really and, and a bit about digital pathology as well so covering a whole range of different topics so do have a look on the website and do register for this event if you're interested in, in exploring more about it as well one of the things as i mentioned we've been heavily involved in is training recovery and in collaboration with the Association of Clinical Pathologies Trainee Member uh, Pathologists a Trainee Members Group, um, we worked developed a survey to explore the impact of COVID-19 on pathology training. And the report that came from this has actually been published in the bulletin and also the ACP News, the publication of the Association of Clinical Pathologists, but it's also been used by senior members of the college in discussions and helping to provision for future training funding um, and the resources to help with pathology training as well. So this is something that we are very proud that we were able to work with the college to develop and is now being helping to um, improve training for the future also. We worked very closely with the college learning team to develop a What I Wish I'd Known series, um, which was a series of videos, um, again, aimed at specialties across pathology. Um, and with, this was produced by trainees in, who are in quite senior positions um, within their training who'd been through the exam process, just to give some hints and tips about what they wish they'd known before they entered the exam process. So quite short videos, but really valuable trainee perspectives. And again, this is a ongoing developing resource. So we're looking for other, um, other volunteers from this, um, uh, senior trainees from this to develop other resources as well for other specialties. So do keep an eye on the college website um, and the, the video library for this, these ongoing resources as well. Um, another set of uh, videos that you might be interested in are a couple of years ago now, Professor Joe Martin took part in an art and science of practical management series um, that was chaired by myself, a series of videos where if you're interested in leadership and management, I'd strongly recommend you having a look at these. Um, from Joe's wealth of experience and knowledge, she talked through some of the challenges of leadership and what she's been through throughout her career. Um, really insightful um, information that she was able to provide. So again, I'd thoroughly recommend having a look at these, um, these videos if you're interested. National Pathology Week takes place every year. We've just had it um, gone by. It's just been part of the uh, Jubilee celebrations, but a really op good opportunity for you to get in other engagement work. Trainees are very frequently seen involved in different projects during this week, engaging with the public and even with other healthcare teams in the profession as well. So do get involved um, for this when the, next one, when the next one comes around as well. And I'll be emailing out to look for volunteers for various different projects um, that we'll be involved in. 
As I mentioned, getting training back on track has been a priority for us in recent times, and we're really lucky to have good representatives on our committee that provide feedback on the examinations and assessments as well, and link that into the examinations committee and the learning team to try and make improvements where, where possible as well. And these, there is much, much more going on as well. It's quite a long list of things we've been involved with already, but there are lots of other projects that are ongoing as well. So hopefully you can see that we do, we, we do a lot of work on your behalf. <clears throat> Some things it can be done a lot quicker than others. So do bear with us, but we're we are working behind the scenes all the time to try and um, implement these changes and uh, develop resources and projects to benefit trainees going forward. Now, again, depending on your specialty, uh, we're certainly very much in the digital era of pathology. And although there probably is more of an impact seen for those, the, perhaps the cellular pathology trainees, there is also a huge benefit um, for the other specialties and the development of resources. And as I mentioned, the pathology portal is one of those massive um, develop, developing resources. And I look forward to sort of opening the, uh, when we're in forthcoming releases where it's opened up to other trainees in other specialties as well, because it's such going to be such a valuable learning resource. Again, accessible from wherever you are in the country and even international trainees and undergraduates will eventually have access to it as well. As I said we're just building the library of resources at the moment for the other specialties um, but do keep your ear to the ground for the future re release dates for these other specialty areas as well. So what advice can I give you for an approach to training and how to be successful with it? Um, one of the things I, th I think is really important to know is that well, there's no competition between, between you as trainees. Again, the, depending on what specialty you're in, you're probably likely to all be sat in the same reporting room together. And sharing learning is really important. So you'll find that the senior trainees will show you interesting cases that they've come across. And you can ask questions as well. Everybody expects that. That's how we all learn. Um, and so don't be afraid, particularly at your early stage, the training to ask as many questions as you like um, because that's how you'll get the extra knowledge and experience from those more senior to you um, and advance through your training really well so share and also that's a message for you as you progress through training always remember those that are coming through within, or in your position um, do help each other as you go through um, a really good opportunity to uh, meet people is to attend conferences and other meetings, um, whether that's at the college or other wider pathology conferences. It's a really good opportunity to meet other trainees in your specialty from different, even different countries, um, but also different areas of the UK as well. And meeting people, chatting people, getting to know them. These are people that are going to be on your career pathway for most of your, for most of your ongoing careers. So look out for them, meet and um, meet and greet them and look out for opportunities where you may be able to get some additional learning and other access to other resources as well. So a really good opportunity to um, make new friends and make new colleagues as well. Having chosen pathology, I think it's one of the one of the few specialties that provides amazing opportunities to get involved in other other activities, whether that's teaching or you may be interested in research and academia um, or leadership and management. There are so many opportunities to get involved in that and your supervisors and training program directors will support you with that wherever you can. Um, for example, in my in my as a histopathology trainee in my second year of training, I was able to take a day out a week to go and do teaching down in London. Um, for teaching some um, on, on pathology on a degree course and the only proviso was that providing I satisfied the training numbers um, of my cases that I'd reported then this this was fine so there is a really good opportunity for you to develop the things that you're particularly interested in and shape the training how you would like to as well so make the most and look out for those opportunities as they come through and one of the other things to say is that this is a specialty that's very, very academic. Um, there's a lot of learning to be had from it. Um, and that learning is ongoing. So just because you, when you finish training and become a, a consultant or an SAS doctor or a senior scientist, that doesn't mean the learning stops. You will continue learning throughout your entire career. And one of the, the, the former presidents of the college used to say that you are always a trainee, even as a consultant. And there'll be cases that you struggle with that you don't know what the diagnosis is or what the answer is. But part of that experience and part of that training process is to actually understand how you go about approaching a case like that and what tools that you've got within your toolkit to help you get to that diagnosis and I think that's a message that that's clear um, apparent for all pathology specialties and for all trainees as well. Um, another thing that some of you might be interested in, it's probably more specific for histopathology trainees, but myself and three other trainees from around the world um, 
put together a future of pathology report in collaboration with the college and lycobion systems which was just talking about uh, molecular pathology and uh, artificial intelligence digital pathology and also the perceptions of pathology and how this chain is changing at the moment and how resources need to be developed to help support these changes going forward as well and it was designed as a resource to be used by the c-suite of different hospital trusts and different other healthcare organizations but some of you may be interested as some of the themes that are in that are relevant across all the different pathology specialties as well. Now, I mentioned that well-being and support is something that the, the trainees, trainees Advisory Committee are really keen on and, and, and the college as well in making sure that you feel supported in your training. And one of the th key things to mention to you is that we will all go through challenging periods. Um, it's not just there may be something at work, but it also could be something in our personal lives as well, whether that's moving house or a problem in related to a relationship or something wrong uh, related to family. There are all these challenges that can impact on your, on your daily working life as well. So the message is that there is support available to you if you need it and to look out for each other as well sometimes if you notice that one of your colleagues isn't quite themselves take them for a coffee and just have a chat with them and sometimes just asking are you okay can be enough just to make them feel that they're supported and just be a, a, an ear for someone to talk to about some of the challenges that they're going through as well and um, one of the things that I found very useful throughout my training is engagement with coaching and also reflective partnerships have taught being able to talk to someone senior within the profession and reflect on different aspects of my career some of you may find that useful to engage with as part of your training process as well. Um, speaking regularly with your supervisors and your training program directors is also advisable as well, just to keep get some feedback about your training, how you're progressing, and if there's area, any reflective areas for development that you could go for. We all have challenges, we all have areas of strengths and weaknesses, and where we, meet, we need to focus, but we need to be engaged and um, be aware of what those might be to help progress forward as well. Some of you may find mentoring useful and there are other organizations, out, other pathology organizations that help to support the development of this. You can also speak to us on the TAC if there are any particular issues related to your well-being and support. Throughout the pandemic, I opened up drop-in sessions where you could come and actually speak to me directly in the evenings. That's an ongoing um, commitment that I'm happy to speak to anybody anytime that they like to, if they would like to speak to me directly about any particular issues, and then I can help direct you to where that support might be available or who best you can speak to. Um, and the important thing message as well is to say that work-life balance is really important. I think you will, I'm speaking to a group of people who well, have had challenges with this in the last few years and all throughout all of your training up to up to now but it's really important that we make sure that we have a life outside of our work and it's very easy for it to sway the other way um, but I, and I think sadly at the moment there is a always an emphasis that to be a good doc, doctor or scientist you have to commit all the hours um, all the hours that you have in a week to, to work but I think we need to be changing that perception that to be a good doctor or scientist or pathologist you need to be someone that's actually can do their work works hard but, and competently at what they do but also has a life outside of that and having that life outside of work allows us to enjoy and appreciate what we do on a daily basis as well. So one of the things that as chair of the committee I've been keen to do is try and imp improve communication with trainees and so throughout the year you'll have regular update emails from me um, and senior members of the college about the ongoing work of the committee and also whether we're looking for particular help or support from different uh, for different projects as well so look out for those. Um, if any of you are on Twitter you can follow I look after the TAC Twitter account at Pathology House. We have over 5,000 followers at the moment which is fantastic um, but again I put relevant information about different pathology related um, topics on there and also advertisements for different events that you might be interested in. so do follow follow the account if you'd like to um, as I mentioned there'll be features in the college bulletin and we are working all the year round so although we have the two meetings the door is always open and you can always get in touch with us um, and ask us anything you want if you have any queries and we can help so can you get involved? Well, absolutely. Um, we need, as I mentioned, we need support and help from the trainee body um, for all the different work that we do. So there are always regular opportunities for you to help us with our individual projects with that. But also due to committee turnover, we're regularly looking for new representation um, on the, uh, the TAC. So do keep an eye out for the emails that will come round about that and also on the college website. And I think there are some positions open at the moment which we're advertising. So see, again, it's a really good opportunity for you to learn a bit more about some leadership and management and if you decide to become a committee representative it's a good introduction just to dip your toe in to see what get working on a committee and part of a team like this is is all about i have been on the committee for a huge number of years now in various different roles and i've learned so much from those opportunities of being involved in that um, and i'm sure you will do the same as well
As I mentioned, follow us on Twitter if you'd like to, um, but also these are my email addresses that you can contact me anytime you like, um, and I will do my best to try and help you with whichever query um, you're, you, you're getting in touch about as well. So finally, just to say again, a big welcome from me. Um, I hope you will enjoy um, your training as much as I do at the moment as well. Um, and I look forward to meeting you face to face at some uh, meeting sometime in the future as well. Thank you very much for listening. Lovely. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was great. Um, so I think that almost brings us to the end of um, the sessions that we've um, had this morning. As I've said, we probably will finish um, a little bit before time. I can't see that there are any questions. So um, hopefully that means that we have anticipated all your questions and our presentations have been so fantastic that um, you don't have anything else to ask us. Um, but I will just allow a minute or two if anybody does have any questions or um, you can email us in to the individual teams if there's something that you um, would like to speak to one of the team members about so either training at or assessment at I, I think are probably the two main ones that you might want to use at the moment um, so training at rcpath.org or assessment at rcpath.org um, there's one other thing to mention to you, which is that we have talked a little bit today or mentioned a little bit the pathology portal, which was launched on Monday. There are going to be two live webinars coming up, one tomorrow um, at 1 p.m. on Thursday and one on Friday also at 1 p.m for half an hour and they are being led by Professor Joe Martin who is the immediate past president of the college but also the lead for the pathology portal project. Um, the pathology portal encapsulates um, learning material for all of the pathology specialties um, and these webinars will just give you um, a chance to have a very brief overview of the portal um, and how you can access it. Um, it's, it's on the ELFH website. Um, we will circulate the links to those meetings to you after this meeting so that if you would like to join them, um, you are able to. And I also understand that um, they will be recorded. So one of those will also be available on the website um, at some point after those meetings. So again, if you don't get a chance to attend tomorrow or Friday or you have other commitments then you can catch up with those afterwards. Um, also just to reiterate again that we will be making all of today's recordings available if you want to revisit anything or if you have colleagues that couldn't attend this morning just do reassure them that they'll be able to um, see everything um, at their own convenience once we've put everything on the website. So I can see we still don't have questions, <laughs> um, in which case I think we will draw the session to a close. Um, I would like to thank everybody that has presented this morning. So um, Adrian and Matthew um, and the whole learning team at the college. Nikki, did you want to give, we've just got to the end, so did you want to just give a, a final farewell? Um, so listen, thanks everyone for joining us today. We hope it's useful. Um, do treat this please as, as the start of conversations. Do feel free to get in touch with the training team whenever you need to. Um, we are here to help, here to help you navigate what can sometimes be tricky, but we hope Evan inevitably will be really successful. So enjoy your time and thanks so much. Goodbye.